Hey, welcome to Taylor's Trip Taking Table. I'm Trip. I just got back from PAX Unplugged, which was a hoot, but that'll be a future video. For now, we are going to jump into my longest video yet, which is about BGG Con, which was in Texas and absolutely amazing, and also a kind of small con of sorts. <laughs> it was just a train I took down from Chicago that was a day long, but me and James Nathan got to play trick taking games and train games on it as well. So, kind of both those cons combined. So it's very long because it was about a week or so of just gaming, just full gaming. And so I'll, I'll try to keep this short. I'll try to keep the montage short also because it's 3.30 in the morning. So if you're watching this right when this is uploaded, this was me. This was me five hours ago. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy how time works? Alrighty. Uh, if I saw you or played games with you at BGGCon, you're in this video because it's very, very long. And it was a hoot. Thank you so much for playing games. It was just the best time ever. All right. Bye. Again, another interesting montage. So, board game geek con and traveling train, taking train, taking con. Uh, we'll start, I'll just do it in, in, in order. So again, I, I flew from Japan to Portland and then I stayed there six hours and then I flew to Chicago. And the flight to Chicago was interesting because it was landing at like 12, 30, 12, 45. And the train, which had James Nathan, was leaving at like 1.30, 1.45, I think. And so I had about an hour to make it to the train station. And uh, I had to go from O'Hare, I think, I don't know, to Union Station in Chicago. And the traffic was super bad, so I had to take the train. And the train was like 45 minutes. So I got there, I was like running up to the train. James was like messaging me. Like, hey, we're boarding, <laughs> it's leaving soon. And I ran up right as we were getting on. So kind of nuts, a little bit, uh, woo, but we made it. And on the train, it was it was so much fun. So James and I, we had just seen each other like a week ago in Japan. So it was kind of crazy to <laughs> meet back up right after that trip. So after we talked a lot about that trip and like we're, we're showing each other the different games that we got, we did end up playing uh, a good amount of trick taking games. And some train games, because I mean, if you're on a train, you gotta play a train game. We played Railway Boom by Hisashi Hayashi, I think is what it is. And then a, another Roll and Write train game about like completing stations, which were, which were both super interesting. I haven't played too many of these kind of like railway connection games. So it was interesting for sure, kind of definitely out of my 
out of my element. But uh, the trick taking, back to back to my element, uh, the trick taking was, was so much fun. So the first game we played was Ore Trick, which I have a picture here. The premise of Ore Trick is you get dealt numbers and suits. And so it's kind of a little bit like Dwa or Dois that we, we covered, a Taiki Shinzawa classic. But the premise is you play a suit and a number to the trick. And then this is, this is at two, mind you, I, I should explain. The game works at two and at four. So at two players, because it was, it was me and James, how the game works is you play a number and the other person plays, you know, either a suit or a number. And then you play whatever you didn't play. So a suit in that case. Whoever plays a suit first dictates the following suit, which is wild. So like, let's say I played a number and then James played a suit. That's must follow on that suit. So when it comes back to me to play a suit, I have to follow that. So even though I led kind of to the trick, I played a number. So I didn't actually like create what lead suit is. Kind of wild. And so you're going back and forth just trying to get tricks. Some cards have like points on them, but one of the main ways to score points is it's kind of fox in the forest scoring where you want you know zero through three but then once you pass that you want you know nine or eight or something so it's kind of like this it has like peaks and valleys where you want to hit a certain amount of tricks and since it was like two player it's it's just like fox in the forest really where the number i want is is not good for you so there's always 10 points given out and if we both get like around middle we both get five but if i get less and you get way too much i get 10 you get zero pretty much that's kind of kind of the vibe. Super interesting. I thought that at two, it had a really fun flow because you actually get to see in someone's hand, and I guess you kind of know, which number of cards they have and which suit cards they have. What I mean by that is like, which ones are suits and which ones are numbers. And the other aspect is when you play, you play once from your hand and then once from face up on the table. And what I mean by that is that the card you play, like a two and then a suit, one of those is always from your hand and one of those is always from the table. And you get to choose whether the rank is from the table or from your hand or whatever it may be, right? So like if I play a two from my hand, the next card I have to play is one of the three face up from the table, one of the suits. So if James, you know, pulls a suit from the table and plays it, or even a suit from their hand, I have to follow suit <laughs> from that play using the cards from the table. Does that make sense? Wacky uh, teach. I just did there. But essentially, there's so much, okay, if this happens, then that'll happen in the game, that you can really kind of plan in, in, in interesting ways. Uh, but of course, you know, you don't know what's in someone's hand, so then it becomes a little bit of like, a bit of guesstimation, unless they like play from their hand first, then you know exactly what they can play from. It's wild. So, um, I, I really liked it. I really, really liked it. I thought the two player was uh, like a really nice back and forth. I had a game that's similar to this, where it's just like an 18 card game that's split up between numbers and uh, suits. Because I, I think after I played Dwa, I was really into that concept. It has the same thing where like you choose one to be your number, choose one to be your suit. But the premise of that one is you're trying to like balance tricks. Whereas this one, I think the fox in the forest is kind of like a tried and true, true tried and true, true and tried, <laughs> uh, whatever that is. Scoring system to where it just worked super well. It just, you know, it's always interesting to see like a game system that you know works and just have it applied to a game because you know the tension's there, the dynamics are there, and there's nothing really like off. It's really cool. I really, really liked it. Spoiler alert, I played it at four later on at BGG Con and whew. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll talk about it later, but yeah, four is like, oh. Then we played Dickery with Jurassic Park cards. <laughs> um, thank you, Hannibal. Uh, Hannibal, the co-designer, sent James this Jurassic Park deck. And so when we played Dickery, it was wild. They are wild cards. I'm looking at a picture now. Sometimes it was like stills from the movie, but sometimes it was like this washed effect. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, Dickery, I wanted it to land super well. I think it was a little off just because we used a, this clock. And I've noticed anytime the discussion of this game kind of comes up, there's three different methods to keep track of what's the strongest card, right? You could use the slider or the clock or just don't use it. I know some people who just don't use it and they just are like, yep, that's that's what the strength is. They just they just kind of internalize it. The clock was, uh, this is the first time I played in person with a clock. I've played in person before with the slider, I think. But in 
person with the clock, it was super fiddly. Oof. So I think that detracted a little bit of the experience. It was mostly good. I think it was a cool thing to show off, but it was so, it was so fun. Sorry, the battery died, but I think that was a sign that we were about to talk about a non-trick-taking game super quick. Again, I'll have the non-trick-taking alert going off whenever it's not about a trick-taking game. But we played a game, I think it was called Conquest or something, but the premise is it's a two-player kind of area majority game. It used a similar mechanic to Loser's Rights, which we covered, where you essentially want to, you know, place your control area token things on cards that you want to value the most. And it was interesting. It's cool to have that work in a two-player back and forth. It was super quick and it had kind of that same feeling of the loser's rights area control, just consolidated into like a two-player snappy game. I liked it. It's always interesting when a mechanism kind of gets down, boiled down to its bare bones and there's like nothing else to kind of save it. <laughs> and then it still works. So that was, that was fun to see. Next we played this, which is like a two-player roll and write dexterity game, I guess. The premise is you're rolling, you're kind of tossing onto the map this die, this die, this pencil that works as a die. So whatever face it lands on, you know, two swords or like three wands or whatever it is. So you'll roll that and it'll land. And then whatever your tip is pointing, you can draw on the number of symbols that's face up on the pencil. It's crazy. It's one of those things where I feel like a lot of Japanese games just look at the world <laughs> differently. It was, uh, it was wild. It was, it was a good time, but it was one of those things where like, if you're just bad at dexterity, you're just, you're just bad at the game. There's no real uh, saving grace, but really cool concept. I really had a, a, a good time with that one. Then we played this one where it was kind of like a bit of a simple version of Tooth and Claw, which is Fuku Taro's. It's like a puzzle game using trick taking rules kind of, if that makes sense. So the premise is you kind of line up your troops or whatever, the cards that you're playing with, and you choose which troop like attacks which troop, and then using trick taking, one of the cards is gonna win. Like if you play a three of a certain suit and they have a two of that suit over there, you're gonna beat that card. And the whole point of the game is you're just trying to get rid of cards. So it's kind of like a shitting game in a way, I guess. I don't know. But uh, it was not, the most fun. I've realized, I think if a game is like a trick-taking game where like it's more of a puzzle using trick-taking rules, the choices have to be pretty complex for, for me to like it just because I, I think that's my least favorite thing in trick-taking games where things can just get very rote and they just almost follow a script and it just doesn't seem interesting. It, it isn't quite fun to me. So when there's like a game that's a trick-taking puzzle using trick-taking rules and laws, and it is a little too basic like this game was, it kind of feels extremely slow or boring or not very fun. Uh, no offense, but yeah, so that was that one. I feel like the crew at one, which we had a video for, that's probably the best solo puzzler that I've ever played. It just gets to that point where the puzzle itself is, is so rich using trick-taking rules. And I feel like that is different than games that I really like at one, like, the Four Northwood solo trick-taking game, where that one is, I f it's not really a puzzle, it's, it's more of like a trick-taking game that kind of has uh, solo puzzle aspects, as opposed to like the crew at one where it's like a puzzle game using trick-taking, if that makes sense. It's kind of like a weird gray, blurry distinction. Then we played the new two-player Master of Respect game. Uh, it just felt super quick and I couldn't really do much. It always feels weird in like engine buildy games where the game's super, super short and it doesn't feel like you can build your engine or whatever. Or games where it's like, oh, you can work off certain things that players do to benefit from that, but there's like six actions in the game. <laughs> it's like, okay. I haven't played a Master of Respect. I know a lot of people like it. I think Tom Vassell really, really likes it. But yeah, the two player was uh, maybe not my favorite. And then we played Corsair, which I think is getting a little bit more into the realm of, <laughs> of trick ticking. So it is a game, it's almost like Battle Line, where you're fighting over certain lines of, of, of sorts. And it was cool because it was a mix of like this engine buildy path game mixed with like making stronger and stronger combinations or melds of, of, a, of a sort. And I really liked it. Uh, I think one huge takeaway, which I thought was so super, super funny, was the combinations had a list of strength 
up in the top, and the bottom one is just called garbage. So I think that's what I'm gonna take away if I'm ever making a climbing shedding game and I need some meld names. The biggest takeaway is uh, I'm just gonna call the bottom thing garbage, where it's just, you know, you don't make anything with it. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's garbage. So that was it for train games. It got cut short at like 10. There were quiet hours on the train, which James kind of pointed out funny enough. The train itself didn't observe the quiet hours. In fact, I hadn't slept on a train in a while, I don't think. And I forgot that it is rough. <laughs> it's quiet hours, except for when the train every like hour decides to blow a giant horn. Oh my gosh. I've lived next to train tracks and I've always been like, oh man, it's so tough to sleep because trains, you know, come through in the middle of the night and they blow their horn and they kind of wake you up. And I didn't realize, what if you could sleep on the thing that wakes you up sometimes? <laughs> so it wakes you up all the time. Mm. Anyway, sleeping on a train would not recommend, but we got to BGG, so totally worth it. So BGG was great. James had been a bajillion times. This is my first time going and first time in Texas, so that was great. It was funny to go from Japan to Texas. It was definitely like culture jumping around. And it was it was great. I met a million great people. And the first day actually was super interesting because we, we showed up and I didn't know what the con was gonna eventually become or be like or be how, how big it was gonna be. But we showed up and it was, it was pretty empty because we showed up on Tuesday and the con I think is around Thursday, maybe Wednesday is actually when it starts. So no one, but really, there's like a table maybe that had a game on it. So James and I sat down and uh, we started playing just, you know, various other games. We played a battle chess game where to capture an opponent, you roll die dice and then you see what the outcome was. It was wild. We, uh, we fought over, we did this thing where we fought these two pieces that were like really strong. So they're just going back and forth for like 30 rolls. And then we didn't even use him after that. Like after one of them, I think he won and took the piece. And then we just were focusing on the rest of the board. It was great. What a, what a game. But then we played Open, the game where part of your hand is face up. I think like two thirds of it is face up. And then a third of it, <laughs> why am I doing these numbers? Four of your cards are face up and two of your cards are face down. And so you can look out at the table because there's it's best of four. So you look out at the other player's hands and you look at your two cards and you actually bid on who you think is gonna go out first. So you get points for going out first. The quicker you go out, the more points you get. But then also, if you bid on whoever goes out first and you are the, you know, one of only like one or two, or if you're the only one who gets it right, you get points as well. So there's like bidding points, but also like shedding out points. It's a really interesting game. I noticed sometimes in the gameplay, if someone could beat me, but they passed, it was interesting because I'm like, oh, I think they're actually trying to get me to go out. So you can kind of help people that you might have bid for to shut out first in an interesting way and then try to maybe hold off on going out just a little bit to try to get that bonus or bid for people who other people won't go out and then it's like the person to your left. So you're the reason, like, especially if you pass, you're the reason that they have an easier time going out than, than on average. So it was cool. I really dug it. It was... I think maybe one of the more played. <laughs> I, I do have a most played game of the con, uh, not a trick digger, but that was one of the more uh, played games because it was just so smooth, such a quick teach. And I really like the systems at play because it only had two suits and a super small deck. And I think like what you can play is either so solos or pairs was just easy enough to grok where play players were like immediately playing. So it was really cool. I really liked that one a lot. And then we played Pin Combi Trio I think it's the new Taiki Shinzawa climbing shedding game. And in that one, you can play three different things. You can either play a single card, and then it's a climbing game, so players, if they wanted to play, have to play a higher single card. Or you can play a run of two. Again, you have to play a higher run of two if you wanna play. Or, this is the kind of craziness, if you wanna play three cards, you, they have to have the same number gap in between the three cards. So you can play like a 10, 20, 30, because it's 10 in between the gap. Or you can play like a five, 10, 15, because it's five in between the gap. And what beats a previous person's trio is a higher gap. So if I play like a 40, 50, 60, that's only a gap of 10. But if you play, oh my gosh, math, a five, 17, 
29. <laughs> it's a gap of 12. So you beat me. So even though the cards are kind of lower, the gap's bigger. Super wild, very mathy. I think I dug it because I just love that kind of math. But woof, there was someone at the table who was like, this is brutal and I really don't like this. So ooh, I think it might be a little bit more of a polarizing Taiki just because it is so math based. Uh, but super interesting. On the train, I got to also show James a couple of my games, Short Zoot Suit and Of What's Left, which are kind of standard deck games. I, I don't know if Of What's Left because it is like a shedding game, where the hook is you you don't want to shed out, but you want to be as close to shedding out as possible, but when someone else sheds out. <laughs> Wacky. But it work, that works, I think, better at three or four. But Short Zoot Suit was great. It's always nervous showing off one of your games, but that was one of the ones where I think the hook at two really works. The premise is you want to short suit as much as you win tricks and you want to balance that. And at two, you kind of get an interesting pace where do you make the other person just win a bunch and slough, you know? So it, it was a good time. Uh, I think that one might shine a little bit more at three or four as well. So it was cool to show off games where <laughs> I almost had an out to be like, so this is the premise and it's cool. But if you don't like it, it's better at other player counts. <laughs> in both of those games, we actually played with John from John Gates Games. And then we played Green Favora with him, which is, I think, another super smooth game. I kind of covered the video for that. I, <laughs> it was one of those ones where you can just, like, at the table as people play, see it click for people, and it, that's just, like, such a fun experience. After that, I had an interesting walk with John. James left to go check in and then the other person we we're playing with who was john's friend also left so it was just me and john and he was like oh we could go get food i said that sounds great so we left to go get tacos <laughs> and uh it was really interesting because so the con was like not really happening but kind of happening right people were kind of trickling in it was a tuesday and we leave the convention and we're walking on the street and we decided to take a left to go to like that taco spot and as we're walking toward those tacos. I see someone who's dressed in like doctor garb and they have like a backpack, I think, and then by the bus stop. And I am walking by and they're like, oh, Taylor? And I go, what? And they're like, yeah, Taylor, like trick-taking Taylor. And I was like, uh, hey, how's it going? They're like, yeah, like I, I watch your channel and stuff. And I was like, no way, <laughs> this is crazy. And I thought, because like, I think that was, you know, second, time or so I've been recognized uh and, but it was like I thought in context of like a gaming convention because the other time was at Vegas and or Tokyo Game Market so in my mind if someone recognized me at like a gaming convention it's like oh yeah 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 like we're here right we're at a gaming convention that that makes sense and it was so funny though because he was like no uh what are you talking about I was like oh no board game geek are you here for you're here for board game geek and they're like, no, I, I like work over here. I live in Dallas. It was crazy. It was like a, a genuine on the street run it. So that was great. Uh, I do feel horrible though, because we were just talking. And I was like, oh, do you want to, like, we're going to go get tacos. Do you want to hang out? And then he's like, oh, no, I, re I really got to catch this bus. I'm like, okay, cool. And we're talking. <laughs> and I'm like distracting him so much that the bus just drives by. Oh, I felt so bad. Oh my gosh, it was brutal. So they uh, didn't catch the bus. Yikes, I'm so sorry. I felt so, so bad. Uh, but I guess they had time until the next bus. They actually, We actually went and got tacos. So it was great. We we're talking about just trick taking games and we actually played Open there, that the, the shedding game that I was talking about. And it was, it was a really fun fan interaction, but it was like one of those like, uh, I felt so guilty. So that was nice to, to hang for a bit. Uh, they did leave to go catch a second bus and they caught that one, which is so good. But <laughs> I felt so bad that just this channel actually had a negative impact on the world by making someone miss their bus. What a shame. Afterward, when John and I got back, we started playing more trick-taking games and climbing shitting games. In fact, what was great was we got to play Of What's Left, my prototype, and then John's prototype which I think is is between names at the moment. <laughs> I think we joked it's it's called like ups and downs or peaks and valleys or or something. But it, we played of what's left at, at four, which was great. I think that went well. What was cool was John and I have actually been talking recently about like what 
we could do to have really interesting tweaks to the gameplay. So it was really fun to show John, who I think has a really great eye for game design, and just pick his brain on, on you know, the, the different ways like the game could pivot to maybe emphasize shedding or maybe just emphasize face up like revealed information or like passing like what can you do with passing so that was really cool and then we also played oh yeah we played john's uh again i don't quite know the name but the premise on that one is i think it's based off of shriesh pins and needles where depending on what you play it's either highest wins or lowest wins just a lovely lovely concept and in john's it's using a system where if you play one, like a solo, a single, because it's a climbing shooting game. If you play a single, it's highest, but if you play a pair, it's lowest. If you play a triple, it's highest again. And if you play four of a kind or, or for a run of four or whatever, it's lowest again. So it kind of bounces uh, around that way. And also there's like tie breaks on cards, like a point system kind of, like a six, it, a six has like a point, you know, one or two or whatever, that kind of breaks size. Super interesting. We were kind of working around the systems of like bidding or, you know, calling double or nothing or things like that. So it was cool to see really cool systems in place, but then also work around with like what makes the game the best way it could be. Then we played Caberstick. It's that worker placement game where, oof, it was tough because I think someone at the table, it was their first trick taking game. And that one's just like so advanced and so tough. And if you are losing going into the next hand, you get kind of a catch-up mechanism that isn't really a catch-up mechanism if you don't kind of know how to handle it. You get, you get to pick Trump, and that's like a really tough pick for someone who doesn't know like kind of like the flow of trick-taking games and like what that really means. So that was a rough one. I think it's always nice to to play uh, trick-taking games out of like my circle and really understand that like they are weird and have a lot of jargon and like systems in place that I think n people new to trick-taking aren't 100% like aware of yet. So it was nice to kind of like get another outside view of the hobby that I think sometimes, especially me, like I get so isolated into like trick-taking that it's nice to like pull myself back out and see like what makes a good beginner trick-taker or like what helps teach the concepts of, of that. And that actually came up a little bit later in the con. Shouts out to Liz. But um, I, I think uh, Kabershik was interesting but definitely not an intro <laughs> trick taking game. Uh, conversely, we played Hachi Train. Oh, such a great one. It's actually like, it's almost like Scout Light because there's no runs in the game. So the, the decision space of like what to put into your hand is, is so much cleaner. Sorry, I didn't explain what Hachi Train is. It's a game, it's just like Scout. If you, if you know Scout, I have a video on that. It's a climbing shedding game where you're trying to get rid of your cards, but when you beat the meld that's at the table, in Scout, you usually would just capture those as points. But in Hachi Train, you put it into your hand. So you have to make sure that the cards you're putting in your hand work with your hand, right? So some of them you'll just pass because it doesn't work with your hand. Um, it kind of works in just that similar Scout vein, just like a little bit less decision space, because you're just like, does this work in my hand or not? Okay, I'll pass, right? The game uh, is super smooth, though, and it was, was one of the better ones to show to new people. And we played it a lot throughout the con, especially showing it to people who... Like hadn't played it before, but had, had played a lot of Scout. So it was fun to show them because they were like used to Scout and like how they use like the Scout skills <laughs> or Scout knowledge to play Hachi Train was really fun. That first day was kind of rough because I had slept on the plane from Japan and then on the plane from Chicago because I took like a red eye to Chicago and then on the train that was from Chicago to Texas. So my last three sleeps were on transit <laughs> and I'm not... I don't sleep on planes, I can't sleep on planes. So it was rough, so I was kind of in a very, uh, <laughs> I was in loosey, yeah, loosey-goosey, loosey-goosey is the right word. I was in that kind of mindset. But it was great because near the end of that first day, we played some games with James, and James at the con, it was so great because he had kind of like a, a bunch of new Japanese games or a bunch of like cool games to test that when you're in that mindset are just perfect. Like we played a game called <laughs> this, sorry, this was like my most played game of the con. It's called Nuts A Go Go, such a game. The premise is everyone has a little cup and when someone says go, you reach into a box filled with these wooden pieces. They're all different shapes. There's like six shapes or so that are nuts, I guess. 
But so you pull out the wooden piece, you put it in your cup, and you're going as fast as you can. You can grab like one or two at a time. And then whenever you want to, you can grab this special piece in the middle called Antonio P. Nut, and that stops it for everyone. And then you start counting down, and it's like a race, and then people have to like clap when they're done. The last person to clap gives you like a penalty nut. <laughs> a penalty nut. Kills me. And then uh, how it works is once everyone has like a cup full of nuts, starting with the person who pulled out Antonio first, they call out a nut and you have to show off that nut out of your cup or else you're eliminated. Oh, so good. So what do you do? Do you try to diversify? You get all the different types of nuts so that you're never caught off guard? Or maybe, just maybe, you get a little diversity, but you specialize in a certain nut type. And you just call them out. Every time it gets to you, just call them. Boop, boop, boop. So much fun. I played like a million times. It plays in like five minutes. Everyone loves it. I think everyone loves it. I love it. <laughs> so much fun. I think I'm gonna try to do a video on it on the side channel, just because it's so wacky. It's so fun. The next day, which I think was Wednesday, you know it was, <laughs> it was one of those cons where you lost track of time a lot and very easily. I spent most of the time in this giant ballroom with no windows and I never really checked the clock. And uh, I pulled two all-nighters over the course of BGG Con. Uh, it, it, uh, it, you just lose track of time, really. It's kind of wacky. Uh, more so than any other con that I've been to. So Wednesday, maybe, who knows. But the, the one of the days, <laughs> uh, woke up, I went to the hot games room, which they show off the new hotness pretty much. So like heat or woodcraft or flame craft or some other craft. Cat in the Box was there, which is super fun to see. I think there were like two tables of it. In fact, when I was walking around checking out the hot games room, there were people who were like, hey, Taylor. Uh, so I got recognized again, which was so nice. They were just the kindest people. And we actually ended up playing games later on in the con. I got their exchange numbers and we played Mask Men and 535. And it was so much fun. I think those games are wacky teaches, but it ended up landing pretty well, I thought. The players really liked it. There's something to, I think most of the players liked it. There's one player who I, I think just didn't like climbing shedding games. I think he preferred more trick-taking games. But it was nice because one of the things where if, if someone says like, oh, hey, I love your channel and stuff, sometimes it's, it's very like fleeting. I, I talk about this like this happens all the time. It's happened like <laughs> a handful of times. But this was the first time I got to play with someone who was like, hey, I like your channel. And it was so much fun to pick their brain about trick taking, what it means to them and like how they found the channel and like different ideas that they find interesting in the genre or like why they like the videos at all, you know, because I'm kind of bewildered that people like <laughs> this uh, channel. And uh, it was just a great time. And then what was wild was right after I ran into another person, or th they came up to the table and said hi, and I got to play a couple games with them. We played Atiwa, which is the new Uwe Rosenberg game about bats. We played that with John, which was a hoot. And then we played a game where you're like drafting your uh, kimono, I think it was called. You're drafting these, these cards in this kind of setup. And it's actually by the person who did Tezuma Master, which is a trick-taking game, which I'll cover in a little bit, because actually, so crazy, I've had Tezuma Master for a year or two now, and at that con, I ended up getting to play that too. So uh, anyway, all, all that to say, this con was one of my favorites just because it was the first time I got to run into people who like have watched a channel, but then also get to like play with them. And I think there's something to, I talked about that in my Tokyo Game Market vlog, where being able to play trick-taking games with like people is just kind of a fascinating experience like to get to know someone. If I was just sitting and, and talking to someone, I don't know if the pressure's on the conversation sometimes or you, you know, you get flustered and so you start asking kind of maybe flippant or like lighter questions, like just like get to know you kind of questions. But like for some reason over Maskman and 535 when we were playing, we got into like, what do you do uh, as like a hobby? And like, it was kind of sometimes like charity work or like just like really interesting values of who they are as a person. Like, like not deep as in like the, my darkest secret deep, but like deep as in like, wow, like I really had a, a, a great connection. And we, we talked a lot about how 
<laughs> just trick taking facilitates that, which was so much fun. So anyway, all that to say, it was such a blast as a convention for running into people who watch the videos, but also like playing games with them, which is, you know, kind of like my favorite part. <laughs> but later on in that day, or I don't even know what timeline I'm on right now, <laughs> we played a couple wacky ones. We played a new Oink game called Overload Cafe, which is essentially the idea of, can you remember orders? And growing up, I, <laughs> I don't know if you've watched my video on when I forgot who my mother-in-law's name was. I don't have a mother-in-law, if that's a sign of how crazy that story is. I worked at my parents' bagel restaurant and I had to memorize a lot of orders because we didn't like write down things. It was just, you got the order, memorize it, took another order, memorize it, took another order, memorize it, and then made them all. <laughs> and then would take, you know, fourth order while you're like finishing the first one. So when we played, it was so much fun because the premise of the game is you just get dealt a bunch of cards and they're all just different orders, like ice coffee, or like ice coffee, no ice. Sometimes there's things like that in it, or like apple juice. And then you shuffle them, you deal them out to players, and then as a group, you have to remember the orders. So it's like a group memory game, insane. But it was so cool because while it was like, <laughs> just pretty much a memory game in the end, I love that a lot of Japanese games work off of the idea of like an, ex like an aspect of life and how do you gamify that? So I, I think that game, even though it was kind of wacky, it stood out for the whole con to me because every time I sat with James and he showed me like a new Japanese game, there was one of those moments where I realized this is just an aspect of life turned into a game. And James actually was telling me, like once I talked a little bit about this with him, he was talking about there's some game in Japan where like it's all about intonation. And the game is about like, how do you say sorry? Like, do you say it sarcastically? Like, sorry. Or like, do you say it like you're surprised? Like, oh, sorry. Things like that. I love just how a lot of times the games I played at BGG Con were just like, what if this weird human experience or part of the human experience is a game? Oh, sorry, got super philosophical there. But we played Nana, then we played Big Top, which are two amazing games. I have those videos on a side channel. We also played Netrunner. I'd only played Netrunner before. And I think the first time you play Netrunner, there's so much jar jargon that it kind of like hits you in the face. Like the HQ and the, and the servers and running and quantos and bombos and it's just a lot. So I had only played like two or three times before and I kind of like fell off it just because I think it's a pretty um, obtuse game just to, to, just to learn. But I played with someone who showed me like this brand new, I think it's like Project Nisei. It's this brand new edition that I think has less friction, maybe is the right word, to onboard someone. And it was, it was just a blast. I think uh, Netrunner is one of those games where it's definitely people's favorite game and a lot of people's favorite game. In fact, when we were playing, someone just walked by and was just like, I love that game, that's my favorite game. <laughs> Which, I mean, anecdotally is proving my point. So I, I think there's something to be said where if a game is, is a lot of people's favorite game, that it almost deserves to have like a lot of time spent learning it. Maybe not, maybe I'm wrong. But it was really cool to play a few games of that and just really get into the world of Netrunner. I'm sorry, this is a trick-taking channel. But actually getting back to trick-taking, we played South Sharf, which the premise is people called it ahead of time like a deck building climbing game. Uh, as much as like Linko is, right? Or like a game where you, you kind of get cards in your hand and then you hold them for a little bit. So it's it's super light. I don't I don't know if I really call it like a deck building game. It's more just like hand management in a way, where you can get cards in your hand, hold on to them, use them, discard them, and then get them back. I don't know. It's really rough. It's it's always weird to be like a, a snob in a way for like certain mechanics. But if like they just don't feel like that genre or that type of mechanic, then it's hard to like attribute that to it, even though it's like technically true. I mean. Trick taking is one of the worst culprits of this, right? Where like if a game has, you pick a card and you simultaneously reveal it and then someone wins. Is that a trick taking game? I, I don't know, you know, if there's no suits, if there's no following, <laughs> but someone wins the, the trick and will take the trick, like is that trick taking? There's always that kind of loose vibe to a lot of these types of games, especially like, again, getting back to this, 
when you do get cards into your hand or your deck and you keep using them until you don't use them. So, uh, <laughs> huge rant about whether it's a deck building game or not aside, the game is interesting. I think I'm going to have a video on it soon. It feels almost like a, like a trying to be a little bit more complicated Linko, and I don't know if I appreciate that or if I like that. And I'm going to try to play it a bit more here and really hone in on what I think feels a little off and what feels right. But it, it was interesting, for sure. I think it has the classic, when do you stop building and start like burning your cards? Because essentially, I should, I should explain how it works. You're trying to, the game has like two phases, where the first phase you're like building up your, your deck, I guess, your hand. And then in the second phase, you're trying to use those cards that you got to make hot sauces or like collect points pretty much and it's like a tempo game to where you want to burn your hand at the right point to get points <laughs> at the right point to get points but also don't burn too soon because that you're just gonna have like no hand really but yeah it was it was interesting i really like the theme then we played animes it was kind of interesting it has a little bit of like a clunky trick-taking gameplay and it almost tries to do what green fivora does but worse and I think James said that first, and I didn't really see it until we played a little bit more of it, to the point where I don't know if I'd ever want to play animes again, but it has some interesting concepts. So the premise is there's certain cards that just instant win. There's cards that if they're the only card in the trick, they'll win. And essentially you don't want to win too much, but you want to win a little bit. The tough thing is this game can go on forever because you can get negative scores and the game ends when someone hits a point threshold. So that's like, ugh, that always rubs me the wrong way. When like, it probably won't go on forever, but like mathematically it could. It, it just bothers me a little bit. The cool thing the game had was you can like mulligan your hand, where after you're dealt, you can choose whatever cards you don't want, put them in the center. Everyone's cards go into the center that they didn't want. And you shuffle, then you redeal. So if I like wanted to keep two, and someone else wanted to keep five, we both turn in a different amount of cards, shuffle, and then we redeal out of those cards. So it's pretty cool. I haven't seen too many trick takers with like a mulligan, but you see that a lot in like Marvel Champions or like those games where your hand is so important, especially your starting hand. So it's cool to see a trick taker handle that. I'd like to see that more where there's like a mulligan uh, just to mitigate that luck. It adds, you know, some fiddle. It adds some more setup, like kind of, it delays the gameplay, but it was fun. I really like that concept. I'll zoom by these because I feel like I've talked about non-trick taking games too much, but we played Loading, which is a real time drafting game. Oh my gosh, fascinating. The premise is you deal out one fewer than the number of players' decks, and whoever doesn't have a deck just puts out their hand. And so you'll look through your deck, you'll draw a card, you'll draft it, and then you'll give it to whoever has their hand out. And then you'll hold your hand out after you've given out a card. So then it's like real time to where like someone's always waiting for one, and then once you're done, you're the next person waiting. It was, it was so good. I loved it. Then we played Golden Animals. It's this simultaneous bidding game that feels like like a super streamlined version of Nid of Lear, if you've played it. It's super clever. I feel like simultaneous bidding just makes things go super smooth, but it also has those moments of just like, ah, oh, I really wanted that, you know? A really cool concept inside of the art, so it's just like absolutely gorgeous. I'll try to have a video for that on this side channel, hopefully soon. But I uh, really, really dug it. Then we played Ortrick at four. Oh, oh my gosh. This game is so good. So how Ortrick at four works, if you skip to now, there's Ortrick at two, which I explained earlier up. Play that on the train with James. But at four, how it works is you and your partner both get dealt equal amounts of numbers and suit cards. And how it works is if I have the lead and I lead a number, then you have to play a suit if you're my partner. And you sit across on the table at me, from me. And then it goes to the next person. And the next person, you know, it's on the, they're on the other team. And they could play, you know, a number or a suit. It just means that their partner has to play the opposite. It doesn't use that whole table system that the two player uses, but I, oh my gosh, it is so, so, so good. Because a lot of the time, <laughs> so you almost have like a hand management where like if I keep leading numbers, it's gonna get to a situation where the, I'm gonna only have suits and we're gonna, gonna kind of get into a pickle, right? If you only lead one type and then you're in a weird situation where you only have that type, the other players can kind of lean on that, right? Where, like, they know that if I can only lead number, then there's less of a choice 
that my partner has, if that makes sense. I should explain a little bit more of how it works at four player to explain how that's nuts, is at a four player, the first two people in turn order on a team will always lead the trick because, you know, we're just playing two cards to the trick. So if my team wins a trick and I'm in the first spot, I'm always going to lead. If the other team wins, the person to my left is always going to lead. And it stays like that until the end of the hand, until those shift. Then I'm going to be in like the hammer seat and then I'll never lead until it gets all the way around and I'm in the second position and the person to my right is in the first position. Hope that made sense. But essentially, if I lead a bunch of numbers and it gets down to the point where I am always going to lead if I do win a trick and I only have suits, then I'm always dictating the lead suit. Because if you remember from earlier, whoever plays the suit first makes it that suit being follow. So it's kind of wild because I can't lead too many numbers at the start because then I make it so I'm the one who's always leading suits to the trick, which is huge because in the game, if you lead suits to the trick, you're going to likely win. And it's a game where you don't want too many tricks because then you overshoot that whole like fox in the forest scoring, right? Where if you get 10 or more tricks, you just get zero points. So it's, it's wild. It's super wild to have that kind of resource to manage with your partner. There's another aspect to it, to where you pass cards at the start, so you can kind of try to remember what's in the other person's hand, and or you kind of show cards, I think, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I don't think you pass, you just like show cards? I forget. But so, um, there's a level of like intuiting what your partner is going to do later, and what you want them to do later. It's super, super clever. There was a moment, which is so funny, or James, <laughs> James like knew exactly what his partner was going to do and it was leading up to be just like absolutely perfect, but then he misplayed. <laughs> it was so good. It was probably one of the funniest moments at the con where James was like, yes, 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 yes. Like his partner was just playing exactly what he wanted and it was looking like they were just going to sweep us. And then he was the hammer though to where the card he played messed it up. Like the very last trick, the very last card. And he was just like, no, and he like ran away from the table. It was so great uh, because someone, <laughs> when he came back, someone was like, what happened over there? And I was like, oh, James is a mind reader, but not a hand reader. <laughs> because he was so like, he was so in lockstep. He was just like, yes, yes. Like he was so happy his partner was like doing everything that was according to plan. But then he didn't realize he had like, a trump in his hand or something that like made him win an extra trick. It was so good. It was so fun. Sorry, James. I don't mean to. <laughs> it's a rough story to tell. It's too funny. It's so funny though. Oh my gosh. It was a hoot. What a game. What a game. It's, it's really, it's something special. I really, really like it. Speaking of James, the next day, oh, what a, what a God. I gotta, I gotta balance my, my James stories. Like he's just the nicest person ever. So I gotta like, so I, I, I feel bad telling that story where he, <laughs> he, he, did not win the trick he wanted to win, or he won the trick he didn't want to win. Uh, with with the stories of that, he's the best, nicest person in the world. He sent out a message one day, I think it was like Friday or Thursday. He was like, hey, we have extra tacos if you want it. So I came down, I had a taco, and then I felt guilty, like, because there were two of them. I felt guilty taking the last one, so I just left it in the bag. So they were just gonna throw it away. And as they were throwing it away, I felt bad that like, I, I could have eaten the, the trash taco, so I was like, oh, I'll eat it. But then it was like in the trash can. So then I was like digging through the trash can. I think he took a photo, which is good blackmail, but can't be blackmail if I'm telling everyone already that I pulled tacos out of the trash to eat. But it was good because uh, we played fisherman and roulette taking. I have a video on roulette taking. It's just a sensational game. And fisherman is the game that the roulette taking people did after. Uh, I'm gonna have a video on it next month, I think, or the month after, because James saw my roulette taking video, and he loves it at four, and I didn't like it at four, and he was he was hoping to play a four-player game of it with me and be like, hey, see, it's good at four. And it was, it was much better at four with, I think, his mentality on it. I still preferred it three, but he was showing off how there's cool moments where, like, it could be two versus one in the bidding, which definitely is lost at three. So while I don't think it's my favorite, he definitely won me over on, in aspects of 
like, hey, there's there's definitely redeeming or like new qualities to the game that I think I may have missed, which is always nice. I love to be shown something that improves a game in a really cool way. And then we played Fisherman, which maybe I'll leave it for the full review, but it wasn't my favorite. The premise is you are going around in a circle after you get dealt your hand and you're picking what matters. So either a certain suit's good or a certain suit's bad or a certain suit's Trump or high's gonna win or low's gonna win. And it just felt a little too loosey-goosey for me, but we will cover that in the video. Then we played Trick and Trade. I think it went over well. I really love the May Follow in that game. It's one of those games where maybe the first time you play it, you're like, what's going on here? And then once you see like certain strategies, you're like, whoa, this game, you can do some really cool things in this game. Like near the end, I just always took lead and didn't mind taking like the worst stock because I was the one who was going to like make the stock market change how I wanted it to change. Because I knew, because I used the May following to keep three cards that I knew were going to win. So that I knew I could always just like win at the end. It was really cool. I really love kind of influencing the market near the end end because it seems like it's just so much more valuable. Winning a trick at the end with like a five or lower is just huge. Then we played Word Tang Tango, which is this, it's kind of like Wavelength, which is one of my favorite games, where in Wavelength you are given a spectrum and you have to pick a clue that goes in between the spectrum wherever the dial is. Word Tantango is almost like the idea of Wavelength, but like the whole thing is player dependent. So players define which words make up a spectrum. So instead of hot to cold, they pick what the spectrum is. Temperature, or like, you know, cool, or I don't know. <laughs> and then the other players choose the spectrum of it. So like if I picked edibleness and the other person picks living, like how a living, how living something is, but another person is going to pick where those go. And then another person is going to pick where the clue is in that range. It was wild. It was so, so, so cool. I loved the aspect to it where it just fostered so much discussion. And James and I talked about this a lot where the idea of if a game fosters discussion and like how it does that, and like the discussions that come out of it, what types of discussions are, are they discussions that you get to learn more about the other person or the other people at the table or learn more about yourself, you know? I think my favorite thing in a discussion is I'll try to articulate a point or I'll be asked a question and try to have a view on that and I'll learn almost something about myself, which I just love. And James and I had a thing where we kind of were talking about how games that foster discussion are kind of the most interesting and to have that as like, why do you like this game? That answer being, oh, because it fosters a lot of discussion is so cool. To almost like seek out games that are discussion generators and have that be like a guiding light is so fascinating to me. <laughs> Again, this isn't trick digging. I feel so bad. I'm like pontificating. I'm getting philosophical. Oh my goodness gracious. Maybe I'll cut this all out, who knows? I'm so sorry for how long this is going, but it was a long con and it was a good time. One of the days uh, a friend Jonah wanted to pull an all-nighter and on that day what was fun was we ran into Tim from Dice Tower West who was playing Tichu with a bunch of other people a bunch of with three other people why am I <laughs> with so many other people uh, but Tim was playing Tichu and Jonah and I walked up and we're like Tichu like ah and we got to pick their brains on just what they thought of trick taking and climbing shedding and kind of like that whole realm and it was so so fascinating to talk to them. Tim asked what was our favorite trick-taking game. And it was interesting because I had actually watched, he, he's on a Dice Tower video for top trick-taking games with like Z and Tom, I think. And his is Bridge. And so it was interesting because, I mean, that question's always tough for me. Even when asked, I, I'm asked often, like, do you have a top 25 or top five trick-taking games? And I've kind of like pushed that off because I want this channel almost to be the journey to a top five. I want like the last video on this channel just to be like a, a top five or a top 25 or at this point, top 55, <laughs> who knows? But I don't have a favorite and I, and I, I, have, I have ones that I really, really like, uh, but I haven't ever like sat down and been like, what is my favorite one? And so I kind of articulated that in a much more succinct way because <laughs> I don't wanna look like a lunatic. But so we got into like that whole discussion of Bridge being the best trick taker or the idea of bridge being one of the like the ultimate like the deepest trick taker or like one of the more deeper trick taking games possible and also a kind of a side conversation of like does it rely on conventions too much or like what does that mean 
Jonah, I've talked about this with him in Hanabi before, where I think he prefers to learn how a game plays through the gameplay, not sit down ahead of time and be like, okay, if I say this, or if I do this, or if I bid this, this is what I mean, but to rather learn that and learn how they play through the gameplay. I think that kind of discovery or that kind of learning about the other person through gameplay is really interesting to him. And I, I totally see that. I totally see what he's getting at. The interesting thing though, was they had a, Tim and Jonah had like an interesting back and forth of are the conventions bridge or like is learning conventions bridge or like what is bridge? And it was really cool. I love that like a game is so amazing like bridge, like so beyond my <laughs> full encompass understanding of it can have different ways to appreciate it, which is really, really fun. But so all that to say, after we talked to Tim, because I think I said Hearts, was Hearts is like a classic one that I'll say is one of my favorites just because it brought me into the hobby and it's just such a good game. He and I were talking about like, how do you play Hearts? And he was saying like, have you ever played Hearts for money? Which I had not. So every time I ran into him during the con, I was, because at that talk, you should find some players. We should play Hearts for money. I was like, still trying to find those players. I couldn't find, I was asking, but I couldn't find anyone to play Hearts for money, which I still to this day think sounds so amazing. I, I think I mentioned it during my Hearts video, but uh, someone showed me a, an Excel sheet where someone was playing Hearts with like a buy-in, and it was like whoever got to a thousand first got like a thousand dollars or something. And they kept track of like shooting the moon and like how many points people were taking and like all the stats that go with Hearts. And I just, I just love that. So Tim and I got off on a, a a really long like what's like actual hearts can you break points in the first trick if someone breaks the queen of spades can you play any hearts does that like breaking points as opposed to breaking hearts like all these different things and that was one of them i hadn't heard of before especially after my deep dive into hearts i hadn't heard of the the idea of if someone plays the queen of hearts does that also open up or sorry the queen of spades does that also open up hearts as uh, something that's now broken super awesome and we actually I ran into him at lunch a different day too. And we started talking about, he has like different tables at his cafe, Meepleville, his cafe in Vegas. Definitely check that out if you're, if you're over there. But he was talking about how they have, I think like Euchre Nights and Hearts Nights and Bridge Nights and how agreeing on Hearts rules is one of the funny things, you know, when like a, a, a game of Hearts gets set up. So anyway, Joan and I were pulling an all-nighter and we were playing Caberstick, that worker placement trick taker, which went over much better. We were playing with trick taking vets and it landed really, really well. And Tim came up and was like, oh, we're playing trick taking. And he was about to go to sleep. So he wasn't about to play a bunch of games. And we were like, can we please show you wacky new ones from Japan? And he was so game, which was so amazing. But we showed him segment tricks, which, oh, I think it landed pretty well. And he did amazing. <laughs> It's one of those things where if you get someone who's like played trick taking games a lot and they just know intuitively when to slough, when to avoid, when to take, how to bid, things like that, and you show them like one of the wackier new trick taking games, it translates. Uh, the skill set perfectly translates. And he was doing, he kind of did it all. He did it to where he took no tricks, he did it to where he bid high and, or like took a lot of tricks and then had a high bid. And I'm pretty sure he won. It's just like one of those games where he, he sat down and like we taught him rules and he was like, wow, that's, this is, this is new and this is different and wild, but yeah, I'm in. And then played it just great. And it was so cool to show someone who is super well versed in trick taking one of like the wackier new ones from Japan. So that was so much fun. Shouts out to Tim. I think when I ran into him another time, we were talking about the idea of how older, more traditional games like Bridge or something, how to mix that into the newer games that players are playing, like Cat in the Box, the new wave of trick-taking that people are getting into and how to balance that. So I think that'd be really cool. I want to do a deep dive on Bridge in the future in, on the channel. I haven't really covered it. I think just because it is such a deep <laughs> pond to dive into. I know Sean Ross will show videos to me of uh, just like hours, hours long kind of commentary games of Bridge where it's like, oh, this person did this or this person did this and like talking about why. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> this game's this game's deep. But I do I do really want to jump into that pool. And so hopefully in the future we'll have like a bridge month of some sort. I don't know what to quite do, but maybe it'll come to me once I play even more bridge. But yeah, so that was that was super super fun to show Tim another trick taking mind like some of the new wacky stuff from Japan. After that we played Jazuma Master, 
which is fantastic. It's another one of those, what is this game gonna be for me? It's one of those games where you get dealt a hand and you'll draft what your scoring is. Do you wanna take a certain matrix or not or slough? And then you'll draft like a power, which is really slick. And you'll draft a pain suit. So it's really cool. It's almost like Niet or Fisherman or Caberstick. I think I'm gonna try to loop them all in one month because it has that kind of same mentality. And it went great. I really, really liked it. I wanna try it at four. I think three was interesting but almost worked out a little too well. So I wonder what four, I wonder four will be a little bit more wacky. But yeah, really cool. I really liked Azuma Master. That was the beginning of the all-nighter with Jonah. We played, <laughs> we played Great Zimbabwe at like three in the morning, four in the morning with another person that we saw walking around. And that was wild. That was the first time I played Great Zimbabwe. I played a lot of food chain and bus, but I hadn't played that one and Jonah was super nice they played kind of like a a loose game where like I was doing a very obvious strategy and he was just like yeah good luck <laughs> I could do this to kind of block you but you know we're just we're just playing <laughs> so I got away with a win but I think it was it was unearned it was not a good win but it, to be fair also it was 4am so what are you gonna do we also it was funny right before the library closed we tried to get a bunch of the gift series because I wanted to show him a bunch of like my favorites. And so we loaded up on GIF. I was like walking to the library with every GIF game. And then they were like, you only get one, <laughs> which is so sad. I ended up taking Tamsk because it's like, it's impossible to find. So I thought I'd take advantage of renting out Tamsk just to play. And we were the only ones who did that. BGG releases the numbers of their library and who takes out what and we were the only ones to get tamps, who knew? But in that one, it's a it's an abstract game, but with timers, your pieces are timers, like sand timers. And you, you play your move, which turns the sand timer and starts clocking down. But if a sand timer piece ever runs out of sand timer, you can't move it anymore, it's like dead. I think, I think those are the rules. Again, we played this at like five in the morning, <laughs> and so we were kind of losing it. So to play a real-time, real-time-ish abstract game, at five in the morning was nuts. It was wild. And then we were just like walking around aimlessly. We went to the dexterity hall and played Crokinole. Crokinole was a good time. I think games when you're on no sleep are kind of wild. It's like a whole new realm to open up. <laughs> I think we actually kind of got in the zone. It was a really close Crokinole game. It was, I think he won by like five points. It was crazy. It was, it was super fun. And then we played Stampede. So Stampede's like this auction game where the hook is, it uses a Dutch auction. And what that is, is where the person who bid the highest, they only pay the person below them's amount. So if I bid 10, you bid seven, and someone else bids five, I win it, but I only pay seven. Or if you bid one, the other person bids two, and I bid a million, I only pay two. So the person who wins, they don't pay how much they bid. They bid, they pay the second highest. So it's super fascinating because how the bidding works is you bid with a number of dice and then you roll and then that's your bid. So if, if you're like, oh, I really want this, you might bid six dice or whatever, right? But if you roll and you get like ones and twos and someone else who bid, who rolled three dice and got like fives and sixes, they're going to beat you. So it's kind of wacky because you have like an input and a decision but then it gets pulled back because it's so random. But then also you get kind of a saving grace because of a Dutch auction. So it's one of those things where it's like, it's balanced, unbalanced, balanced. It's really cool. I really, really liked it. It was a good time. It leads to those moments where I think oftentimes in an auction game, you're annoyed that you lose a bid. That's like the classic auction game. Hey, I wanted this. I bid a lot and I didn't get it. You're a jerk. But one of the cool things is in a Dutch auction is if you bid a lot and you lose, you at least bid so high to make the other person pay a lot. So it has this funny thing where losing an auction still feels good. I, oh, so good, so clever. And then we played, we played Tiger and Dragon, that new Oink one, which is kind of like a beating game. I feel like it's like a worse version of Blaze, if I'm being honest. There's kind of like a, a lot of pomp and circumstance and there's something to like Mahjong tiles that I don't think I like. You have to like wash them. I think there's almost a ritual to it that people do enjoy, like Black Swan or Mahjong, but I don't know. I, I don't think there were many like choices in the game. To be fair, we played it at five, so maybe it's better at three or four, but not my favorite. Then we played, oh my gosh, talking about favorites. 
we t played these two games, which were so amazing. We played Judge Domino, where the premise is you're building this domino line, and on your turn, you can either add a domino to the line, or you could be like, this domino line won't complete. Whoever knocks this over is going to miss, or whatever. You can just pass. And once everyone passes but one person, that's the person who has to flick the domino line. And they can't just like rocket mortgage. They can just like whap it. They have to like actually like flick the dominoes. But it is so good. There's a game called Illusion by Wolfgang Vosch, which is kind of like this, but just with like dexterity and dominoes. And it's so much fun to <laughs> be the last person to knock it over and try to knock it over. And people like bet on if it's gonna go over or not. It's so much fun. It's a hoot. I, I love it. It's about, uh, by Itten. I think we had a Kickstarter for it recently, but yeah, definitely check it out. Then we played Make the Difference which is a new Oink game where the premise is... I actually have a sheet right here, so I just play. But the premise is you get a bunch of these little drawings and everyone gets a drawing, like a different drawing. And you, at the same time, are making five little marks on it. And afterward, you compare your drawing to the original and people have to spot the difference. It's like one of those like kids pick five differences or notice the five differences in the two drawings games, but you're the one making the difference. And if people don't find it, you get more points. It's so much fun. It's, it's, <laughs> I showed it to a lot of people in the States now, cause I got it back at Tokyo Game Market. And it is just like landed so well every single time. All right, late night, all nighter, speed round. We played Stereo Mind, which is a game where you hear a sound and you have to attribute it to one of like six things, like brother, sister, mother, mom, dad, uncle, aunt. But it's just like this instrumental music. And then you're trying to all have the same one at the table. It's wild, it's great. Soundbox, it's by Horrible Guild, where everyone gets assigned a sound, and then someone closes their eyes, and then all at the same time, people are making those sounds, and you're trying to like <laughs> hear, you're trying to hear the sounds, and then after the time limit, you open your eyes and you have to pick which ones you heard. It's wild, it's insane. Played Lum Lum Party, which is like group bingo, you know, who knows. We played a game called Keepa, where a player picks a category and then a range. Like I picked beverages and the range was breakfast to dinner and then thin to thick. <laughs> and then you just put one example, like where your mindset is. And I pick like orange juice, right? And I put it like, you know, breakfasty, not too breakfasty because you have, I don't know, screwdrivers or uh, some adult beverages, I guess, or dinner beverages, use orange juice. And then, you know, there's some pulp, or sometimes it can be a little thicker, so I put it like a little, a little bit thin, but not too much. And then players just like put what they think around the table. Um, and the premise is you want your points as far away as possible, because how you score is you wrap a line, like a string, around all your points, because you have three points, like that triangle. And the longest triangle gets like more points. It's crazy. It's so, it's so clever. Sometimes playing games with Jim brought a deck where you can see the backs of it, kind of like Caddy or, or Scan or whatever, or Sharp Shotten. And we played, a, there's a design set with a bunch of those games in it. So one of them was by Alan R. Moon. It's called High Low, where you draft cards and then at the end you want to either have the most tricks one or the least tricks one. And so it was interesting. It was a little I thought the drafting was gonna be a little bit more interesting because how the drafting works is face or in front of you face down are six cards and you can take whichever one you want because you know the suit so you'll know because it's like a must follow game and like trump is like one of the cards to the side or you can you know flip all the cards that have the same suit face up and pick one of them and when that would happen i think it was a little too obvious when someone was going high or low and so I, I wanted a little bit more mystery there, but it was cool. It was cool to like balance it. I think Somnia is just a better game because you try to go high or low during the trick play. And I think there's a little bit more nuance to it. Whereas high low was like, before you even play trick taking, it's just a bit obvious of where people are at. So then it's almost like just bidding outwardly and then playing trick taking. I don't know. It was interesting though. It was, it was overall cool. It was by Alan R. Moon. And then we played another one by the designer of Zaraba 22, and this was nuts. So the premise is you get dealt your hand and it's all face down and then they all have little tokens on them. <laughs> and I don't even know how to explain this game if I'm being fully honest. The premise is you want to, you either don't want to win any tricks 
or you want to win a trick, but before you have won a trick, look at two of your cards. Because if you look, if you choose, you can always choose to look at two of your cards. But if you do, you have like these curses. Like if you look at two cards, you have to look at cards in pairs of twos. You'll take the tokens off the cards, and those are curses. And the only way to like clean those curses is you win a trick, and then you put one of those tokens on top of the trick you just won, and it cleans the curse. So the thing is, either you don't win any tricks, and then you shoot the moon, or whatever the, the the vibe is, or you look at your cards and take the curses to try to like win tricks and then clean the curses up. And when you win a trick, there's like a pool of curses in the... <laughs> this game is so nuts! There's like a pool of tokens in the center, because if you ever play a card, because you can see the backs of the cards, so you can always follow suit. If you ever play a card that had a token on it, it goes to the center. And so there's like an anti-system where like some people are just playing cards that have those tokens on into the center. And if you win a trick, you actually get half of the tokens in the center or all the tokens in the center, depending on if you knew where the card was or not. And if you get a certain amount of tokens, you can consolidate... <laughs> this game's nuts. You can consolidate two cards to make one of them trump. And there's like no other trump in the game, so it's like super strong, so you're like guaranteed to win a card. It's wacky. It's super, super wacky. It's one of those games where like the rules teach is like insane. But then once you get into the into the gameplay, it, it gets more streamlined and it made more sense. I don't know if it's worth it for the rules teach and the kind of fiddly nature of the game. But it was cool to see. I always love seeing what people can do with a scan deck or like a deck where you can see the backs of the you can see the suits on the backs of the cards because that that's such a cool design space. The fact that you can not know what your card is and still follow and still have it be a trick-taking game, like with, you know, standard must-follow kind of vibes, is super cool. And it, it, I think it does, it does something new. <laughs> I think it was just a bit wacky for my taste. Then I joined a pitch card tournament where I would have gotten third, except, oh my gosh, I'm so mad. They had this rule where if you, someone flicks their car and it crosses the finish line, but then goes off the track, it still counts. What? I was like near the end, I was about to win one of the races, because you play three races, but I was about to win that one, and someone just like flicks it as hard as they can, and they're way in the back, and then they go off the track. And in my mind, you know, you have all these like rules in pitch car where it's like, if you go off the track, you have to go back to the start, or if you flip over, you have to spend a whole time flipping back. It's like this system where you want to do crazy things, like flip pretty hard or like go for wild moves, but if you go for two wild moves, there's like a limiting thing. So I don't know why they allowed it just to go crazy at the end. But, ah, uh, that person just like rocketed off. And in my mind, they're like in the stands killing people, right? Like if this is an actual car, that person's dead. So, I don't buy it. Uh, anyway, a little salty. Would have gone third. I'll still say I got third. But pitch car tournament was a good time. It was a hoot and a laugh and a goof and a gaff. Then we played Touchdown Heroes, which, oh, that game is so nuts. Talk about nuts. It, it was super late at night and Candace was there watching me teach it. And the game is just so wild. I should probably have a video for it soon. It's made by the people who did Just Heroes and Top of Hanode Town. But the premise is it's like a football game where it's only played in partnerships. You play as a team against team with the person across from you. And you try to get touchdowns, try to get field goals. It was wild because it worked out to where it came down to the last kick and the person kicked it and it tied. And so we had to tie. It was wild. I think that game would be really fun to play like an actual season at like a convention where uh, there's like playoffs, you know, and there's like a Super Bowl. That'd be super, super fun. But yeah, Wild Wild Game, the premise is like, I've covered it in my T7 video, but it's a trick ticking game where if you run the ball, it's must follow, but if you pass the ball, it's may follow. And the person who leads the trick, like the quarterback, gets to choose which one they want to do. So really clever. It's just a zany, zany, zany. I probably should make a video because it's kind of hard to explain how zany it is without seeing the game. I had a really fun trick-taking moment with Jonah and a new person I met, Liz, who's so great. Jonah and I were returning our games after we played Zimbabwe and Tamsk, after the long all-nighter that we pulled. And Jonah had a game of food chain in the morning with Liz. And we met and we're just hanging out before the food chain game started. And Jonah was talking to Liz and I had on my badge, it said press. Because as a joke, I thought it'd be funny to say, oh, I'm a press channel because of Taylor's trick-taking table. So I said Taylor's trick-taking table and that had press underneath. 
but I was embarrassed because people were just like, why are you pressed? Like, and I felt so bad. So I would like cover up the badge sometimes. And we're talking to Liz and Liz was like, oh, I don't really like trick taking games or like trick taking games are just like, whatever to me. And I felt so nervous. I was like, Ugh! and so like I hid my badge and Joan was like, you should show her your badge. <laughs> and uh, no, uh, I left that and ran into the Liz and Jonah later. And Jonah's was like, oh my gosh, I showed Liz roulette taking and trick takers and a bunch of other, I think another one, another trick taking game. And Liz is like a convert now, which is so great. I think um, she has now seen why trick taking games are just the best in the world. And it was so fun to like at a convention in real time, see someone who didn't play many trick takers or liked them. I think she liked the bottle imp before. I don't think she liked poo poo trick takers, but just didn't, <laughs> it was just like, okay, yeah, whatever. They're just like a random genre to being like, these are pretty cool. I eyebrow raising cool. This is so long. But the last night I was talking to someone who was in the pitch car tournament and we were like riffing and, and goofing and, and gaffing. And I, I saw them playing Greets and Boblin and I ran over and I was like, hey, I played this as an all-nighter once. And the guy was just like, oh my gosh, that's, I was so, I was wondering where I knew you from. And you're, you make those trick taking videos. I'm in the BGG trick taker guild. And it's so awesome. And I was like, oh my gosh. It was like another like random run in, which I also had uh, the last day with, with PK, who, who just amazing, who uh, <laughs> was wearing like a, a wild outfit. I think uh, he, had, he had socks on that were like CBS socks or something. And uh, I, I told him a bit about the, my Taiki Chunzawa sock adventures. So we had, we had some sock related uh, <laughs> revelry. But overall, it was just so much fun. I think the whole con, just meeting the best people. It was so cool to talk games with the different people in the industry, like BGG people, or just like publishers like Alex and James. Just like such an interesting perspective on games or, or Tim or random people I played with who had such a great approach to gaming in general. That con itself was just so focused around play. And I think play itself is my favorite thing to do at a convention. Like, I, I, I totally love Tokyo Game Market because you get to see different games, or like Gen Con, you go to like the booths where you do events and stuff. But like, just to be able to have a con so dedicated to play and playing so many trick taking games was so much fun. Also, one of the highlights of the con was we had kind of like a hub for trick taking. Like, people from there's a trick taking Discord, I'm in the Portland Game Collective Discord, where we had like a thread of just like a meetup. So it was Chris and Aaron and Taylor and Derek and Alex and Howard. It was cool to have like a group of people dedicated to trick taking at like a hub. So it was really fun. To the battery died <laughs> again. This is brutal. But to go over to that table and just always play like a new trick taker. And it was so awesome because everyone brought a pack of like these amazing trick taking games. And it was like a, an abundance of riches. I don't know. Just to just to sit there and just play like, oh, this is another one that I got from Japan a while ago and I hadn't had a chance to, to play it and to sit down and actually get to play it. Like Tezuma Master came out of that. Or we played a lot of Kaberstick, I feel like. I got to play a game with Eric Martin, which is huge. I always wanted to uh, do that after, I think his videos are just so interesting to me. I didn't want to bring them up at the time. I didn't know like what the level of fanboyism would be, but his video were like, he just puts games back into boxes or he cuts up games like Furnace into like smaller packages. I just love this. I just love that like mentality in the kind of space. Like, a lot of times board gamers have a, a little bit of like a strictness to, to board games and his uh, his viewpoint and his videos are just so fun to see just kind of, yeah, this is a, a way to approach board gaming that's like so, so different and so fun. I got to play open with him and Melissa and James, which was such a hoot. I feel like, cause Melissa was the other person if you watch my Tokyo Game Market video, she was with Sherry at BGGCon who won the Tichu tournament. So it was so cool to show her uh, a shedding game and also Eric and see kind of the wheels in motion and, and how to evaluate other people's hands, knowing people who have played, you know, climbing shedding games before and have that kind of like that skill, right? I talked a little bit before about Tim translating skills and other trick taking games to new ones, new crazy ones from Japan. And it did the same thing. It worked fluidly. And it's awesome to hear like their opinions on the games, especially with how wacky some of them are. Oh my gosh. Okay. The battery died like 20 million times. I just gotta stop. Thank you so much to everyone. It was just an absolute blast. The train playing trick taking down with James was like so, 
so much fun. I feel like that in and of itself was like its own con. So to go from that to then BGG Con, where it was just millions of people and so many games and so much time, so much, so many amazing times, <laughs> that it, it, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I almost said speechless, which is comical because I've been talking for 20 hours, but genuinely, uh, it's hard to describe just like the amazing time I had playing and then meeting. This was a con where I met so many more people that I've ever, ever met and run into people who, who watch the channel. And so it was, it was so nice meeting y'all and playing games with y'all. I feel like that's like the thing, you know. All that say, it was an absolute blast. Thank you so much to everyone. Oh, so much fun. Just, I can't wait. I think BGG is just the top of my list to try to go back to next year because it was just so joyous just to like play games with everyone and just have a good time. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Sorry for rambling. It's probably been like 20 hours of editing. <laughs> good luck, Taylor. Hey, bye. bye.